Candy Council, right, okay. So, okay, so, because I remember you saying very shortly after the election that mm -hmm. if it had gone to a second count... Oh, I would have won. I would have won. Yeah. If, 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 if uh, he hadn't got over the line on the first count, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would have. I had. A, I had all this, the number twos. You know. It was you would have got the transfers. I would have got all the transfers. Yeah. 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 I mean, if um, if Sinn Fein had got their normal, Martin got fourteen point seven percent in the last election, mm -hmm. and uh, Leah got uh, what, five point six percent. You know. I mean, it was. Bizarre. It was a, a, a dismal result for, for Sinn Féin, wasn't it? Yeah. It really it was. So, but well, I, I thought the Sinn Féin vote was the same pretty much as the, you know, the Donald Trump vote. I mean, Donald Trump will get 31, 32% of the vote, irrespective of whatever he says or does, yeah. you know. And I really felt that Sinn Féin uh, was in a similar type of situation. You know, I just felt that they... Um, uh, would have, and I, I think they're going to do very badly in uh, the next general election, you know. Do you know, it, it struck me um, during the campaign, and it was such a whirlwind. I mean, there seemed to be, you know, three of you everywhere and three mm -hmm. of all of the candidates, they, you know, so busy and so pressurised. But I got the sense, apart from one mm -hmm. notable time when you were very upset, I got the sense that you were thoroughly enjoying yourself. Yeah. You know, it was um, you know it was a new experience, and uh, the first debate, uh, what happened was they sat us down and uh, they said, well, you know, here's the rules: you don't talk over each other. Uh, we'll make sure that you all get the same amount of time, and um, you know we'll measure it very accurately. And so, mm. I just behaved myself and next thing you know I'm looking at the clock and it's about 20 past the hour and I'm thinking there's only another like you know and I haven't spoken a word yet yes you know? yeah and Gavin had w would interrupt and would you know challenge and then they would ask. you were right at the end of that, that mm, row right. of uh, candidates weren't you yeah, yeah. and um, it was bizarre you know that and, and so and after the debate uh, you know, my PR person came up to me and said, w w what happened? Like, were you nervous? Were you struck dumb? <laughs> you know, why did you not? And I said, well, I, I just assumed that they would give us the same amount of time. Mm. And so after that, I decided then just to go for it. Go for it. Well, well I thought you did, actually. Every time mm. I did see you uh, on, on, on television or on radio, you, 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 you got stuck in straight away. But look... Peter, first of all, uh, welcome to The Other Side. Delighted mm -hmm. that you're here. Um, the Other Side is really about everything uh, other than your election, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the presidential election, although we've been talking about it, um, and the Dragon's Den as well, uh, when you were an investor there. So, so we're, looking at, we're looking at the man behind the public persona. And so there, there really won't be many questions at all about uh, the Dragon's Den, your time on that. Or the election, um, but I'm interested in what formed you as a young fellow growing up uh, in Derry. I'm interested in in what made you the person you are. Everything that happened actually up to the point that you became the person that became very well known to to all of us. And I I, I have fixed that at the first time you broadcasted uh, your very first broadcast. I think it was uh, about three four years ago, 2013 when you, 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 you went into uh, the den mm -hmm. as, as, as an investor. And then, obviously, the, the election brought you into the stratosphere in, in terms of you became a household name in this country. So we're interested in everything after that as well. So we'll generally bypass th those two areas. So if we could, I'd like to start with um, you, as a young fella, mm -hmm. 9th of October, uh, 1957. Don't, re don't remember much about that. Day. That was your birthday. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> don't remember much about the day itself. Yeah. What was the family that you were born into like? Describe them first. Um, I was the third, so uh, there was Shira, uh, my older sister, then Patty, uh, and myself, and then I, I had a brother who died uh, at very young, so there was a gap. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next, there were sort of stabbing stones all the way down. So there's, uh, <clears throat> uh, so there's, and I think then, uh, so there's 
uh, quite a gap. There, there was right. two family units. There was the three older ones and then the five younger ones. It's like a different you know. generation, nearly. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I, I would be five years older than the, my next sister, and then the, they were stepping stones. So there's like nine, nine in the family? So there's nine children, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, it, it, I mean, it's, it's many years later, but and it, it must be difficult to kind of process that, but if you could describe for us what it was like to grow up in a very large family, uh, a very large Catholic family, mm -hmm. um, in Derry at the time of the Troubles. Um, <clears throat> well, we initially were in a very small little house, I have vague recollections of it. Interestingly enough, I actually went back and looked at buying it, just because I was buying investment properties mm. in Argyle Street. And it was a little two up, two down with a outside toilet, you know. And um, then we moved when I was probably about five. Or, so I've got very vague recollections mm. of that house. Uh, we moved to Bishop Street. And my father was the secretary at the time of St. Columns College. And my mother worked at Nather's house. So literally it was... Uh, a hundred yards to the Nathers house where I went, mm -hmm. and then I went to the Christian Brothers, which was... Nathers, uh, that, that was her school, she was a teacher? She was a teacher, teacher yeah, yeah. in Nathers house, and then, so oh. I, um, and then the first recollection really, uh, you know, it was um, very happy, mm. um, you know, um, I don't know, I look back now and I wonder, you know, how did my parents ever afford to feed us? Uh, you know, I know, and how did they Huge ever? I, I still remember when we got our first TV, uh, which was a big thing, you know, and it was a, uh, uh, it was a, you know, a very old one, and, uh, you know, and, and it kept been breaking very down. In the neighbourhood, oh no, 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 we were no, no, everyone else had a TV. Oh, they we all had one. We, we, were, we were the last. <laughs> we were the last. I think we were the last in the street to get a TV. Right. You know, and I remember. Uh, you know, one of my tasks used to be to go to the laundrette on a Saturday with a lot of the washing and I would, yeah. and then a, a big change in our life came when we finally were able to have my mother, we somehow got a, a twin tub washing yeah. machine. Yeah. So that Is that the one where you, because we had something like that where you, you drag the clothes out of one side and into the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah and start a big stick. So we, we had, um, and that was, mm. you know, and I, I was probably nine or ten when we got our first car, mm. which was a Ford Esquire uh, WLK w, 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 546. This is the reg. That was the registration number. It, it must yeah. have been a spectacular thing though to, to you know. Again, we were probably the last one on the street then. to have a car, yeah, but we would all yeah. pile into it, you yeah. know, and uh, go down to... Were you, 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 you were a troublemaker as a kid, were you? Did I read somewhere that you, uh, your hobby was rioting? Uh, that was not a kid. Uh, that was, was that when I was older. That was, no, no, that was when I was older. As a child, I, you know, I was... Uh, I wasn't really much into sports, uh, apart from handball. And I used to play handball every day, so that was I didn't really get into the GAA, yeah. you know, uh, Gaelic or hurling. Um, <clears throat> handball was my thing, so I, um, you know, I, 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 you know, looking back, uh, I, you know, I never needed for anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had no idea how. As I said, my parents provided. I know, how it, they coped. You know, it's amazing, you look back and on And they it. probably didn't go on about it either. You, you probably didn't get a sense no. that they were worried. Uh, my father, when I got a little bit older, you know, around about 10 or 11, yeah. would show me the bank statements, you know, and show me how much he was overdrawn. Right. <laughs> you right. Know? So, you, you, so you, I, you I was very much aware of finances, finances at, at an early age, you yeah. know. Um, were you entrepreneurial as a as a young fellow? Um, no, not really. I mean, my first but making way of uh, well, that's not true. Uh, I mean, I got a job working um, in Kevin McLaughlin's motor uh, on the Bunkrana Road uh, when I was eleven, twelve. Mm. I think it was eleven or twelve. I was got paid four pounds a week. That's uh, good. You know, that's uh, good money. That was in the summer holidays, you know. Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, Very good. Yeah. So, and I got paid overtime if I worked on right. Saturdays and Sundays. And 
uh, which I did. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, so I worked in McLaughlin Motors for like, when I was 12, 13, 14. Uh, then I got a job on a building site in the summer when mm. I was 16. Um, but, you know, I, 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 uh, you know, I was always conscious of the fact that there wasn't much money in mm. the house. And your mother, uh, you mentioned your mother so many times mm -hmm. during the campaign. You know, you mentioned your wife and your family, but your mother was, was obviously a big <coughs> influence on you. What, what was she like? Um, oh, she was very definitely a, a huge influence, uh, larger than, you know, life personality. Mm -hmm. uh, she was that sort of person who would light up a room. You know, she was a yeah. great um, entertainer. Like when we would have big parties in our house in Atlanta and she would sing and recite poetry and stuff, you know. And she was the president of St. Vincent de Paul. It's probably why we never ran out of clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, She's a kind so woman. Very, very much so. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I, I remember uh, my, my father's, uh, when he passed away, there was uh, like 20 priests and two bishops uh, concelebrated the Mass, you know, and I remember one priest coming up to me and saying, gosh, she's getting a tremendous send off. And the whole church was completely, like, people were, uh, she, massively overpacked and mm. you know it, you said, just imagine how big your mother's funeral would be you know I think that's a strange thing to say to someone <laughs> you know yeah, anticipating yeah, that I still remember father, your father's his name was Father Barr and I remember him coming up to me saying that he said oh, yeah. great son of people said, don't know what to say I think, I suppose they, yeah it's one of those they feel awkward and they they want to comfort and sorry for your trouble seems to be yeah. the thing to say but it's very trite isn't it, it, it yeah. yeah so that was well, but you know it um, what age were you when your father passed um Oh, uh, that I, I was um, probably, he was 63 when he died, uh, so I I was in Australia, uh, so I was probably 28, 29. Yeah. He, he went young? Yeah, he, uh, both my parents uh, died of pancreatic cancer, they both um, uh, lasted three months, you know, my when my mother got it, uh, she was 83, and I said to her, so, you know, what treatment are you uh, going to, you mm. know, go with? And she said, 20-year-old whiskey. She said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she said yeah. So I like the sound of your mother. Yeah. <laughs> She's yeah, right. And she, she actually um, flew out to Atlanta uh, after she'd been diagnosed, and she, you know, maybe six weeks after she'd been diagnosed, and yeah. we had to help her in and out of the swimming pool every day. But you know, we'd have a nice glass of champagne waiting for her when she got out, and she, she actually did drink a full the, bottle the drop of, of whiskey. She did. Uh, we'd have a nice wine at night with a meal, and yeah. she'd have a nice large whiskey, um, and she drank, she drank, she drank the bottle, <laughs> <laughs> and in the in the. In the and good for In the her. week that she was there, yeah, good she was tremendous, her. and she never, you know, for someone who's obviously terminally ill, yeah. you, you know, you, you certainly wouldn't have known. It's probably uh, realistic as well that it's, yeah. it, I mean, it, she it's a tragic diagnosis, isn't it? It's well, it's unfortunately, it runs in our, our family, unfortunately. Mm. You know. Well, you, you know, the going back to, to uh, that, that time in, in school, I think you're a very mm -hmm. clever boy. You, you passed your 11 plus, didn't you? you uh, did I wouldn't well. say very clever. I, I have, at that time, I had a sort of, um, I still have it to a limited extent, but of sort of photographic memory, so I could look at stuff and then remember it. In those days, I could remember it for a long time. You know, now it, it'll... And you just did the reg of your first car, mm -hmm. which is, you know, Yeah, I can, decades I, I, ago. I have a, a yeah, that's... Yeah, that's 50 years ago, I suppose, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's interesting, you know, that I, I had, in those days, I had a phenomenal memory. Yeah. Uh, today, I have to work a little bit harder to remember things. But, yes, uh, yeah. You know, I, I always, well, that was useful, especially sitting the, the 11 plus. Yeah. Um, I mean, I ended up with 11 O-levels. Mm. I think the average was usually 7 or 8, yeah. you know, and but they were all... Uh, in those days, they used to grade them uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. There was a pass, and then seven, eight, nine was a fail. 
I remember thinking, you know, I wonder why you've got three different grades of failure. I mean, either you fail, <laughs> either you fail, or you fail, you know. But it's, it's uh, the same now. You can't fail the leaving cert. I think. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, I, you know, I said to my, you know, my father, I rang up and uh, to get the results. And on the day that the results came out of the O level, you say, and. Uh, Mr. McGonagall was the vice principal, and he was giving out the results. And of course, mm. my father, at this stage, had been promoted to the bursar of the school. Mm. And so I ring up, and I go, um, Peter Casey numbered him. He said, "Yes, I, I know who you are." <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, "English language six, English literature six, physics six, chemistry six. He said, "Why don't we just save ourselves a lot of trouble? They're all sixes." <laughs> You weren't at sixes you know, and sevens, all sixes. All sixes. Great no, results. All passes. And consistent. All, all passes. passes. And then and, you went and to... And so my mother, yeah. you know, I'd say, and uh, my father sort of took me aside and said, you know, you really need to stop sailing so close to the wind. He said, those sixes could be all sevens, and you would, you know, you'd have been out of the school. And my mother said, son, I'm sure they were nearly all fives. <laughs> you know? So that was, you know... Brilliant. So she was... The you know, optimist. Yeah. She gave you confidence, people. Um, yes. I mean, obviously, I was her favourite child. Maybe you know. she just said that to you. My mother said that to me, too, but apparently she said it to all of us. I think, well, they, they, they all seemed to think that mm. they were, for some reason, yeah. they all seemed to think that they were her favourite. But, but you I, really were. I, I, I know you really I was. Were, yeah, you know. yeah. And, yeah. And she did say to you that she wanted you to consider uh, running for the presidency. No, no, I told her I was going to run. You said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I told her when I was going to Australia. I said, um, you know, she was all upset, and I said, you know, I said, I'm definitely coming back, and one day mm -hmm. I'm going to stand for the presidency, you know, and she just stop, stop talking nonsense. You know? And you I did. Said, I will. You did. You know, so. And you did very well. Tell me something. Uh, she didn't want you to be a priest because normally a big family like that. Well, it's, it's actually not true. No, they 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 um, they signed me up for the the I think it was the white the white fathers or something. Yeah. <laughs> And they kept sending me literature and stuff, you know. And um, I remember I went to see my career guidance counsellor, and um, you know, I after being encouraged so much by my mother, uh, parents, because they, they were very religious, you know, and church every obviously every Sunday, and <clears throat> and um, so I actually went to the career guidance counsellor, you know, and I said to him. Uh, Father Michael Henney, his name was, you know, I said, so, Father Michael Henney, I said, so, Father, I don't know what I want to do, you know, I said, what do you think? Is it? I said, do you think would I make a good priest? And he looked at me and he said, Peter, you'd make a good priest commit suicide. <laughs> I said, I, I think, I take it that's a no then. <laughs> God. He said, a very definite no, Peter. A yeah. no would have sufficed. <laughs> yeah, I said, you'd make a good priest commit suicide. Oh, you know? yeah. normally in a big family, there, there's one or two, there's a, there's a nun well, in, in the making days, or a priest. You know, yeah, in, those, in those days, there encouraged. used to be, uh, you know... They, he discouraged you in the way. He, yeah, he, he, I think he realised that I wouldn't um, fit in. It might, mightn't be your calling. So yeah. you went to Aston University in Birmingham, mm -hmm. and I think you studied... Uh, Philosophy, philosophy and economics, yeah. Philosophy, and you were you did very well in philosophy. I did, yeah. Uh, uh, it was one of the, it was one of those things that I have always been had a very strong interest in in sort of trying to work out the meaning of life and mm. the meaning of it all, and, you know. And yeah, you know, I went through a, not a dark period, but a, you know when I lost a friend who died at the age of. 12. That was my first experience, you know, he died of uh, leukemia. And then, you know, I went through a... I got into um, existentialism. I started mm -hmm. reading uh, books. On yeah. it. First one was uh, uh, Albert Camus, La Peste, uh, you know, and uh, I really enjoyed that. But then I started getting into the whole concept of existentialism and, you know, then got into Kierkegaard and reading other uh, Jean Paul Sartre, yeah. and I, you know, it just it I found it very in, uh, intriguing. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, I think leaders, particularly from the ancient world, w would have all been philosophers as well, and there would have been a huge mm -hmm. and that's 
Maths would have been a very important mm -hmm. uh, discipline too. I think uh, in Athens, any leaders had to study maths for at least ten years before mm -hmm. they could even. Yeah, I, I then got into go the Greek, the, the Greek philosophy, yes. you know. Yeah. So uh, and uh, you know uh, Plato's philosophy of the elite, elite and the concept of um, you know, and then of course. You know, you can't. The concept of uh, leadership kind of appealed to me. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you know, it makes sense. You know, you can't get better than the best, mm. so you want to be governed by the best, which is clearly mm. not the case at the moment. But listen, you did brilliantly at philosophy. Well, yes, that's another. I did. Yeah, I did. it was but, something. But the business module, you you were struggling with. Yeah. Funnily well, it, it wasn't so much into the business part. I did fine it was actually the statistics uh, okay. and i just couldn't and um uh, you know the uh, quantitative mathematics uh well, the, i just my brain doesn't work that well with numbers and now it does you know yeah. um but I very nearly, you know, I did so well in the philosophy. I got the first in philosophy, and I, I nearly, I nearly failed completely because that's why I ended up with a second class <laughs> honours. But, but I did so well in the philosophy. Which is, it, it would got, be ironic if you'd, if you'd failed business. In the business, but, but yeah. um, well, we 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 know you, of course, as the hugely successful CEO of of, of Cloud Resources. But I, I don't think, I, I'm not sure that everybody knows. That you had a few business ventures that didn't work out, and that you you, yeah. you really lost a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Skydome comes Sk to mind. Skydome was. Tell us what that was. Well, it was um, after I'd sold the company in Australia, and I thought I'd made enough money not to have to work again. But and the company uh, being. Uh, well, it was an executive search firm, Trinity. Yes, Trinity. Uh, well, I actually Trinity had Group. I had three or four companies. Actually, I had a serviced office business, um, so which was Trinity. Uh, serviced offices mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, that was an interesting story because what happened there was um, Oracle we set up in the serviced office complex and what happened was uh, the next neighbor the person in the office next to me was being sent out to open up a small software company called Oracle and he was telling me how this company was going to be Oracle relational databases were going to change the world and how this was, you know, hierarchical databases were a thing of the past. And mm -hmm. I didn't even know what a da database was because I didn't own a computer, so I didn't really. But he uh, said, look, we're going to be needing some staff. Can you help? And I said, of course. So, okay. And that's how we got into it. So anyway, they uh, expanded very rapidly. And then I took on staff to build out my business to support them. And we ended up taking over the whole building, Oracle and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then Oracle moved out overnight uh, into their own company, their own offices, number one Pacific Highway. Um, they took the top floor of this most prestigious building. But they left the, basically the building that we were in pretty much empty except for ourselves. And the owner of the service office complex went broke. And the building owner came to me and said, well, it's, you know, it's partly your fault because you, you, you screwed him so much on the rates. Yeah, and you know, I said, well, it's nothing to do with me. It was Oracle, you know. Okay. I said, I just piggybacked off mm -hmm. Oracle. And he said, well, would you be interested in, in buying the service office comp business, you know? And I thought about it and I decided, um, yep. So I then borrowed the money to buy it, uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, take it over. Uh, yeah. I, I essentially inherited all the furniture and the fit out for free. And the landlord agreed. I signed a new 10 year lease and on the property and uh, he gave me a year's rent free. And then I filled up the service office business uh, the, and um, really focused on delivering a very high quality, excellent service to the tenants, you know. And I give them all three or six months rent free, depending on how long a lease they sign. Okay. And within six months, I'd rented out the entire, oh, I'd filled out the whole building. Uh, and then uh, about six months later, I decided to sell it. And I sold it. And that's when I made my first uh, significant chunk of change, you know. And At what age? Uh, that would have been. 
uh, and then what happened then was I, um, the person I sold it to uh, did a really bad job and all the tenants moved out and he went broke and then the building owner came back to me and said well you're still on the hook for the lease because it's a tenure and I but I and I hadn't really realized the implications of you know I was still on the hook for the, the lease so anyway I, I negotiated with him and he agreed to give me uh, six months rent free if I took it back over again and, and so, got it up to par again. so I took it over again built it up again and uh, sold it again uh, but this time I said, I'm off the hook for the lease. You know? <laughs> and so I'm not coming it back. Was, it was, so it was just like the gift that just kept giving. Yes. Yeah. Know, it was wonderful. And, um, and so what happened after that? Um, I then ended up um, selling, uh, well, I then got into other properties mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I bought another service office complex, built that up yeah. and sold that. And but took on more properties. And, and, and what was Sky Dome? Uh, well, Sky Dome was uh, that. That was after I sold uh, all of the companies. When yes. I unfortunately I ended up getting divorced, mm -hmm. and um, my wife sort of uh, at the time, you know, decided that I was. We were. We'd lost a couple. We'd been on the IVF program, and yeah. we'd been lots of attempts and we had one baby who was bought and lived for a very short time and died but it was a very very Sad. dark Sad. period Sad. of Sad. life but you know and she she quite rightly said you know you're I'll never make you happy and you know you just want to make money and have children and I can't provide you with either and she said I think it's it's best that we separate you know and she's an amazing lady yeah. she really is and so but you know it was just um, it, she made the right decision actually because she ended up um, meeting a. She left and went back to England and she married um, and a, and he's. They're very happy and. It's, and so are you and, and, so and are, you went on to meet Helen and. Went on to meet Helen and so it was just probably hard to see that you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel at a time. In those like days, and you know, at that time, tough. it was very hard to mm. see if there was light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it was yeah. a very dark. But then, Sky Dome, uh, I sold the company uh, and. The, went back to Ireland and set up Skydome. Uh, it was a tributor, basically you put a, uh, a dome on the roof and there's reflectors that reflect light down through a flexible tube, comes out through a diffuser and um, you know it was going gangbusters in Australia so you know and um, we started manufacturing it uh, in England, uh, assembling it in Derry and it went so well, you know, the first, um, you know, year and it just exploded. And um, I, I was selling it by the truckload, the lorry load, you know, like just containers going to Australia, all over. Um, we didn't do well, so well in Ireland because obviously there's not much sun in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you think about it logically. Yes, you, you kind of need you, that you need sun to <laughs> for this, this product. But then we got, and then we brought in investors because we we were growing so fast that we needed additional funds, and it just the more successful it was, the more money required to keep it to fund the growth. And what happened was I had to bring in investors, and that's where I learned the the most important, so one of the most important lessons of when you're growing a business: when do you bring in capital? You know, and when you bring it in, how do you bring it in? And you know, it's it's um, it was a very painful lesson because I didn't understand preemptive rights. That's uh, essentially special rights that, as the founding shareholder, you can hold on to your voting rights, so you can bring in investors, but you can uh, in a different sh classification of share, so they'll have ownership, but you will still retain the voting rights and the controlling rights and. I uh, basically make it, made, a, made a mess of that and ended up getting diluted every time we brought Your share in. Share holding was diluted. Was being diluted every, every time, time we, we brought in. in. Yeah. And <coughs> by the time I realised, uh, you know, obviously it was too late because you couldn't change the articles of association. You have to have 76% control of the company uh, to change the articles of association. And 
I, I didn't realise all these are things you learn as you but, go but along. But you, I, I think you have to fall like that. Uh, well, it was a bit in order unfortunate. To, to yeah. really know what, uh, you know, the right way to go. It, it, it's, uh, you know, I made uh, so many m time. mistakes. Mm. You know, I, I didn't take out uh, adequate yeah. insurance against litigation. And of course, then eventually we got litigation, uh, got into a patent dispute, and uh, I hadn't taken out adequate funding. So anybody, my advice to anybody who's going to America, um, there is one thing that's absolutely certain, you will get sued at some stage, you know. So make sure if you're going to America that you do take out uh, legal insurance. liability insurance, you know. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, we got into a patent dispute, we got a cease and desist, and we couldn't sell the product. We actually had to take the product off the shelf, and then we had to destroy it because we couldn't keep it, you know. And, and um, you didn't have the funds to take on the, the, the lawyers? We didn't have the, the, the funds to take on the lawyers. Mm. Um, so that was a very, um, yeah. That was tough. That, that was, was tough. tough, yeah. That, so I but ended you know, up, you, uh, yeah. they ended up, so the <clears throat> banks ended up repossessing my houses. So I've, mm. I think I'm probably the only person to actually, you know, stand for the presidency who's had houses, two houses repossessed. Your homes were mm -hmm. repossessed. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at, and, and I think it's, it's, it's well established that you, you struck a chord with people who are struggling in this country. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, and I think that possibly is the reason why you jumped from 2% in the poll to 23% of the vote. 23.4, but who's counting? Sorry, 23.4. Oh, yeah. absolutely, 23.4. Mm -hmm. So, but the people that are really struggling at the moment here, uh, I think they're going to take heart from your story because you, you just said you, you, you lost your homes twice, mm -hmm. you lost everything and you bounced back again twice. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to them, people that are going through repossessions, people whose businesses have been wiped out? Do you know, it's, 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 it is tough and you have, to, you have to understand that it happens all the time. Um, you know, the statistics are that 80% of all new businesses will close down within two years. You know, that's the, the, the statistics, you know. Um, you know, cash flow is king. Um, I always say to people, the most important thing is to, when you're doing your, your budgeting, uh, double your costs and half your revenues when you're doing your projections, you know. So whatever you think your costs are going to be, double them and half whatever you think your revenues will be because and then you won't be shocked or then surprised. you won't be shocked and but well you probably still will be shocked <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, but you know that's why i say to people just uh, you know and always always uh, you know plan for you know a disaster because mm. there will be disasters there will be you know things that will you know uh, come along and yeah. you will be audited by tax you will be you know, you, you will have your legal bills and your accounting bills will all be much, much more than you think they're going to be if, you, if you're in America. Mm. So that's very good advice. But you mentioned a surprise there. And, you know, don't be surprised. But, but you surprised Helen some years back. Uh, oh, I think I've surprised her many times. <laughs> but this one was big. This mm -hmm. is a castle. You bought her a castle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> She wanted, uh, she said she wanted an old building, so <laughs> I... What's uh, this with dragons and castles? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it was, this was, we'd just come back from Australia and yeah, she, she actually, Alan had gone over to um, England and stayed with a friend of hers and her, uh, the, the friend lived in a very nice, uh, it was a 200 year old house that the, the family had renovated, you know, re restored and renovated. And she was very taken by this, you know, and and I was so absorbed with Sky Dome and wasn't seeing, I was traveling like to Australia every month. I was like traveling everywhere, like just, like, just nonstop. And uh, she said, well, look, you know, maybe if I get something to do, you know, get a, if we buy out an old house, I could be, you know, restored and renovated. So I rang up the real estate agent and I said, what's, you know, the oldest property on the market at the moment? And he said, well, Learmont Castle has just come up, you know, and, oh, can go and see it. <laughs> so we went out and saw it and it was... Um, Where was it? Uh, it? It was in a place called... Uh, 
Park near Cloddy, which was about 15, 20, 20, 20 miles outside Derry. Okay. And um, so it, it was, uh, it used to be the ancestral home of the Earl of Donegal, I think it was yeah, called, you know, yeah. so, uh, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so it didn't have electricity, it had gas lighting, but you know, it was, oh, it was magnificent, yeah. you know, and it was um, in a, uh, there was about 200 acres of beautiful sort of land around it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you didn't actually own all of the land around it. That, that was owned by the Heritage Trust, but obviously nobody could build on it, so right. essentially it may as well have been yours, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it, the Fahan River, which is what lovely, beautiful Salmon River, was literally 300 yards from your front door of the castle. But there's no uh, electricity. There's no electricity. <laughs> and it's but, haunted. <laughs> no. So, but it was the magnificent cornices and the... You, you know, are in love with this building. Oh, it was fabulous, you know. But so she I, said, go and take a jump. She didn't want it. No, what happened was, I, uh, we went out. So that would have been, Finbar was one at the time, so he's now 28, so I was like 27 years ago. Mm. And uh, we went around, walked around it, and I got the key, went inside, and... I said, what do you think? And she said, oh, it's gorgeous, you know, it's mm -hmm. very nice, you know. And there was, there was magnificent big rhododendron, and they were flowering, and the bushes, thing. and I said, oh, it was just so beautiful. And uh, I said, so, and I think there was atom fireplaces in it, you mm -hmm. know, like these really beautiful marble fireplaces um, in most of the bedrooms, and, it, you know, it was, and I said, so what do you think? She said, oh, it's, it's it's, isn't it? It's, it's fabulous, amazing. And I said, I'm glad you like it. I, I bought it, you know. And she said, you what? I said, well, you said you wanted something old, you know. So anyway, uh, she said, uh, well, I hope you'll be very happy here. I'll, I'll never spend a night here, you know. Dear. So, um, yeah, that was a little bit of an and unfortunate... And how long did you um, have it before you, you Oh, you Lord, it, it took me about five years to sell it. It took it, you five years to sell, to sell it, it, yeah. Fortunately, yeah. Um, just after the Good Friday, you know, after the Good Friday Peace Agreement, because yes. it was actually in a very uh, Protestant area and there was a lot of sectarian, you know, trouble there. Mm -hmm. And um, there were actually Claudia itself, I don't know if you recall, there was a very very bad, uh, big, major bomb. It went, I think a lot of people were killed in mm. Claudy, which is only five or six miles away. So it, it wasn't, it was very remote, you know. Uh, but I, I did finally sell it. And, and you <laughs> made a little made, profit because profit on it, a bit yeah. more optimism in, yeah. in the market at the time. Yeah. Um, you wrote a lot of um, opinion pieces mm -hmm. for, for .ie, the online publication, over the years. And I think in 2016 you were urging us to leave uh, Europe. I, I was urging us to keep an open mind, you know, I, I think that there's this fixation that, you know, the world begins and ends with Europe. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at where we export, our largest export uh, partner is, of course, the United States, where we export 28.7% um, of, of our exports go there, and then uh, the next, of course, ex large would be the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, mm -hmm. which is around about eleven point seven percent. So if you add those two together, mm -hmm. you know you're looking at forty percent of our exports. Um, Europe is important, uh, of course. It's a, you know, it's a major market, a major opportunity for us. Um, but you know, I, I think it's wrong to forget. You know. There are other countries in the world, <laughs> you know. There's and you say most of our businesses with with the know, UK and with the UK with, and, with and the in the states, you know. So mm. I am, I would, you know, I, I think that Germany has become um, really the major power, obviously in Europe, uh, and uh, you know, fair play to them. Like they, they've grown that way because, well, first of all, you know. They weren't allowed to have an army, which helps when you don't have to pay for an army. You know? <laughs> uh, and the German um, psyche is one of austerity. 
you know, they, 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 they are very responsible, much more responsible than, than, than us uh, in Ireland. You know, the average person in Germany will not buy, um, you know, something if they can't afford it. Okay. You, you know, they sure. typically... They're more disciplined. They're much more disciplined. See, they went, they're, the people that are running Germany at the moment are the children of the people who went through the, the, the they remember the food stamps, they remember, you know, they, they, they remember the, the, the terrible times and the shortages after World War mm -hmm. II. Fair enough, obviously, Mar martial aid went a long way to helping rebuild in uh, Germany, but, you know, there was terrible... It wasn't that long ago when you think of it, it really. It really wasn't, you know, it was in like, it's the 40s and 50s and, you know, yours truly here was born in the 50s. So a lot of the people that are running Germany now are the children of the people that, mm. you know, went through those terrible times mm. and they, they are, you know, very responsible now because and they you know said what we're, it's we're, like. We were pathetic negotiators. Uh, well, oh, clearly, you know, in we, Europe. We, we demonstrated quite clearly that... Uh, you know, we, we, we can't negotiate. Uh, whoever heard of bondholders... Could you see holders? yourself doing some negotiations? That's what I do for a living, is negotiate, you know. Um, so, yeah. I just want to ask you, just something that... that um, a story that I, I heard about you, actually, uh, and I, I'd like you to tell it, 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 it from, from the beginning. It's, I think you're not long out of college. You're mm -hmm. in sales. You're mm -hmm. doing very, very well. You, you're mm -hmm. instantly successful uh, in in that world, the sales mm -hmm. world, and you walk into a pub some night. You're work, working for zero. Well, I went to pub every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, well, this yeah. particular night, yeah. you met a guy in the bar, yeah. and the guy in the bar also worked for zero. It was a Friday. It was a Friday night, you know, and um, uh, I didn't know what he did, but I knew he worked up in Euston Road, which was the head office. He, you know, but yeah. I, he didn't say what he did, you know. And we got talking, got very uh, you know, friendly, and we ended up having quite a few, you know, and a few beers and whatnot. And then he turned around and said, you know, I asked me did I golf, and I said I did. And he said, do you want to play on Sunday? And I said, oh, that'd be great, you know. And so he invited me up to his golf club, and um, I turned up in my little uh, Sunbeam Chrysler uh, <laughs> car, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's my company car, and he turns up in a you know top of the range Jaguar, you know, and I'm thinking, I never actually got around to ask you what you did, John, you know. <laughs> I, he said, I, I I run Europe, you know. I went, oh, fair enough. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, we became good friends, yeah. and he became a mentor. And I think it's very important that people get mentors, you mm. know. And uh, the reason I've been um, I think successful in uh, as I've always tried to find mm. mentors, you know, and I I really think it's very very important. Uh, if you're in business, uh, you should always try and get a mentor. If you hadn't met this guy John, mm -hmm. if you hadn't met him that night in the bar and befriended him, and I think he encouraged you after that. I think he went to Australia. After yeah, that. he. Would, yeah. would your life have been different? Do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I think going to Australia completely changed, you know, the way I looked at He encouraged things. you to do that? He encouraged me to, and indeed arranged for me to get a, you know, transfer to Australia uh, within Xerox. So that was, you know... Was, um, and what happened there? It kind of uh, took off very quickly. <clears throat> yeah, in Xerox, um, I got... Actually, I was very homesick, so I... Uh, my way of getting around it was just to work seven days a week you know mm -hmm. I just I was first in last out every day I just you know because I was so uh, homesick and, and lonely took, and where was your savior yeah and it took quite a while to actually well, that made you successful obviously then, yes working yeah I mean I I was there um, there was a competition they'd been running for six months and it was a 12-month competition and I ended up uh, winning the, the 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 competition in six months, you know, and ironically, the prize was a trip to Europe. So I was back home <laughs> <laughs> six months after I had, had left, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it was a great experience. I mean, Australia is just a, an amazing place, and I would encourage um, you know anybody who hasn't been to go because mm. there isn't. 
Oh, well, the people you that know. I know that have, that have emigrated to Australia, they really feel they're living the dream now. They're, they're having a wonderful time. It, it, it really is. They're appreciated, yeah. you know. It really is. It's a very open society. It's a very tolerant society. Mm -hmm. They, you know, there's... Um, you know, they, they really do... Uh, the work conditions are good too, and the, you know, the living conditions are good, and you've got the, the sunshine, so... Oh, it, but it's, still, it's, it yeah. was so far away from home for in you. Those I mean, days, it's, it's so easy days, now to it, Skype it, and, and Well, in, in touch, those days, when I went to Australia, they held like what they call an Irish wake, because normally in those days, I went in November the 3rd, 1981, and uh, I remember, you know, we had, we had quite a few parties before I left, but uh, it was really, you weren't really expected to come back, certainly not yeah. for quite some considerable mm. time. And in interestingly enough, um, I had to go on a course uh, before they'd give you your visa for Australia. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, they, I remember uh, the instructor, of course, saying this is a very unusual, he said, this is a very special course. He said, this is the last uh, assisted passage. Because in those oh. days, they used to actually, you pay £10 and they would get, you know, and the, they were actually trying to build up Australia, you know, and uh, so that was... They were closing the door after they were closing that? The, they were closing the door on the assisted passage. Right. So in those days, so now that would have been, uh, so I went, I arrived in Australia in November um, 2nd, 1981. And so I went on that course in, I think it would have been July or August. So that, it's not amazing that not many people would realize back, back there, that's when they were still offering people Ten pounds to uh, travel to travel to Australia. To travel to Australia. And I were you lucky, entire, Peter? Because you, you, your timing is very good from from what you're saying. Well, in terms the, of your Xerox uh, paid for my airfare and they paid for myself. <laughs> yeah. That part was good. Um, but the yeah, we we had whole families in Derry would migrate to Australia mm. on the assisted passage. You know, uh, and it was very definite. And you, the, you couldn't also if it didn't wasn't working out and it was dreadful. You, you, you didn't want to come home with your tail between your legs either. Well, You didn't want to disappoint Well, I, I don't think it was an option, you know, you, yeah. you, <laughs> if yeah. you're there. You're stuck. But you're stuck. But yeah, it was such an amazing place. And mm. I, I, I just, um, once I got over the homesickness mm. and then realised that, you know, I could, I could actually fly home any time I wanted. This you is know, it, once, once, you, once you're doing well. Yeah. Then a few years later, you started the Trinity Group. Yes, um, I started Trinity Group in um, uh, three years after I. Okay, so and, that would have been and, in What basically was that again? What, what, what well, that was, was the, essentially business? that was just a recruiting salespeople for Xerox, right. and okay. I, was, I had actually become a branch manager, so I'd yeah. become a sales manager, uh, and then I got an opportunity to go and work for another company as a state manager called OC, uh, OCE. Uh, uh, O.C. van der Grinten, they're a Dutch company, um, and they were a competitor to Xerox. And one of my mentors went as the CEO and managing director there, and he offered me a job as a state manager in New South Wales. And I did that for a year, but Xerox then offered me a job back there as a branch manager there, which was, I think, you know, it was quite a big step up. You know, I was the youngest branch manager in the history, I think, at the time. So I thought, but it really didn't work out. I'd just gone back to Xerox after experiencing the, the, the freedom of being a state manager running the whole operation, mm -hmm. just being a branch manager running a branch working for a state manager didn't really work out. So I left and um, I decided to uh, go find another job, and <laughs> it's quite a funny story. My mentor at Xerox, uh, when I he, who brought me back as a branch manager, mm. uh, Peter Russell, his name is uh, Peter, left Xerox, and a person who I didn't get on with got promoted into his job as the head of sales and marketing, and he you know he called me into his office and he said, you know, he said, Let, let's face it, Peter, you don't like me and I don't like you. <laughs> he said, one of us has to go 
and um, I've just been promoted. <laughs> no. So he said, why don't we just, you know, why didn't you head out? Why didn't you just take a bit of time and get like Oscar Wilde, yeah. one of us has to go, and well, he's looking at the, uh, the, the wallpaper yeah. in, in the hotel <laughs> in Paris. So you went. <coughs> so I went round. But you had options. Well, I went round uh, the recruiting companies looking mm. for a job, thinking I'm God's gift. You know, I've been so successful at Xerox and whatnot, you know. I shouldn't be any trouble getting a job. And they all had beautiful offices, you know, these recruiting companies. And I remember thinking, you know, you know, after about a week, none of them had got me an interview, none of them had got, you know, mm -hmm. and I was saying, this is ridiculous. I mean, here I am, God's gift to creation, you know, in terms of sales, and not one of them has got me an interview, you know, and I was, said to my wife at the time, I said, this is bizarre. You mean, why have they not got me? He said, well, maybe it's not that easy. He said, okay. I said well, of course it is. All you've got to do is just pick up the phone and say to someday, I've got Peter Casey here, you know. He said, well, if it's that easy, why don't you do it yourself? You know, so I said, fair enough. So I actually did. I rang up four or five companies, got myself interviews, got myself a couple of job offers within about a week. And I remember thinking that was very easy, <laughs> you know. Well, you were good at sales, of course. <laughs> this is your area. You know, so I got a job offer as a sales, state manager for uh, a guy called Jeff Talbot, who was the um, head of sales and marketing at a company called Triumph Adler. They were a competitor to Xerox, and they sold copiers and uh, word processors and stuff like that. And uh, I said, Jeff, look, I really appreciate the job offer, but I've decided to set up my own company doing recruiting. But I can find you somebody, you know, and, um, you know, for a, a reduced fee, you know. And, and uh, he said, okay. And I, I went, and that was my first. Placement was actually, I, I found a replacement for the for job that I had For got. the competitor of the, uh, yeah, the, so the crowd I, that you worked with. So, Peter, in 1985, uh, in Trinity Group, I think you were offered the, the, the biggest uh, staffing contract at the time that existed at the time.